thanks very much. Um, yeah, hello guys. Um, Chuidag to the Dutchies in the room. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen and get this started. So you should all be seeing um, a slideshow. It's not sure. It's this button instead. Um, yeah, so I work for the Institute of Strategic Dialogue. It's London based. I'm based in Ireland um, at the moment. And today I'm going to be talking to you about conspiracies, disinformation, misinformation, extremism, hate, harassment online, and how these things all, uh, all intersect. Um, so quick kind of running order about this, um, what extremism look like, looks like today with a special focus on far-right communities in, in Ireland and beyond with, um, with some examples and some, some, some definitions. Uh, we'll be talking about the lure of lies and conspiracies and the orchestration of hate. And here I'll talk through some research that uh, myself and some of my colleagues have carried out, especially around kind of narratives employed and, and the, the kind of online tactics and tools used uh, amongst kind of online extremist communities. And then we'll be talking specifically about online spaces and platforms, the kinds of places uh, where these um, conversations where this kind of activity is taking place and then just before the end just the impact of COVID-19 how this kind of colors everything and how things have have changed or been adapted or, or, or morphed in the last 18 months two years and and the last slide just asking kind of where uh, where to next um, so zooming out uh, how do we see extremism play out today and explicit uh, uh, far-right activity. Uh, far-right activity represents a very active extremism in Ireland and beyond. Um, Ethno-nationalism is, is a constant. It's best encapsulated in Ireland by this Ireland for the Irish phrasing uh, that defines Ireland as a monocultural nation for white Irish people only. This belief is then demonstrated in reactions uh, or sentiments towards housing rights, healthcare, and of course, immigration, and more recently towards uh, COVID-19 and reactions towards this. This is replicated across all uh, European nations, all nations in different ways, all serving to articulate some form of us, uh, the natives, versus them, uh, the foreigner or, or the, the invader. Broadly, such communities support nationalism and nativism, uh, they engage in racism against minorities in the state. They support xenophobia and even uh, authoritarianism in, in some corners. And all of this is seen in support and, and commenting um, upon the activities of, of far-right political figures or groups or also on international developments too, as they, as they may reflect on the country and can be framed in a, in a positive sense. This also means sharing support for similar parties and figures abroad and generally expression, expressing uh, their wish for, for something similar to happen in, in Ireland or in the, in the country on the country of note. Uh, narratives and myths are essential to, to far right extremist ideology uh, and community formation and are the tools uh, used by such communities to express their beliefs and try to frame events or developments in a way that supports these beliefs. The narratives we see circulate within these communities are, are those similar to other nations, that is narratives of victimhood, of a loss of, of culture, of white culture, or the local kind of native uh, culture, or a community under attack. Uh, these are the building blocks upon which extremism and, and hatred is formed. Uh, these narratives address emotional needs more than ideological ones, perceived hardships that members of the in-group face uh, can be framed as a consequence of the actions or perceived actions of the outgroup, uh, be that the state or actions by minorities. And um, the narrative also offers solutions to these problems, that is, join us, support us, become one of us. Uh, reverse discrimination being demonstrated uh, in, in the belief that migrants are, are being housed before Irish people, for example. And to, to varying degrees, uh, far right factions, groups are hostile to liberal democracy uh, and are broadly anti system. Um, they reject uh, diversity in all its forms. This is common too. And this can manifest in the encouragement of violence. And at all turns, we see uh, extremist communities lean on conspiracies to support their position and, and make arguments that frame their stance um, positively. Um, so why and how do conspiracies spread? Why are they used? 
Um, on the left, you'll see the conspiracy chart. This was designed by a, a misinformation researcher, uh, Abby Richards, breaking down some of the most popular or common conspiracy theories online today. At the heart of conspiracies are also uh, people or groups who have a vested interest in, in people believing them or making people believe them and essentially using and, and operationalizing these conspiracies. And this is where we see extremists and extremist behavior kind of intersect with conspiracy theories, especially online. Um, conspiratorial belief is linked to certain psychological needs that are, that are not being fulfilled. Uh, for example, the need for knowledge and certainty and, and a desire to know why certain events take place. Uncertainty increases in times of crisis, such as a pandemic, which means that more people will be drawn to conspiratorial narratives. If people aren't satisfied with the agreed upon reasons for, for certain events, conspiracy theories can seem more appealing. They're often simple narratives that, that allow people to easily recognize who is on the side of quote unquote good and on the side of evil. Uh, stripping out the complexity of a situation. The, the brain loves this. Um, they also give people information that gives them a sense of control during crisis situations. And, and this idea of access to secret knowledge uh, is also found to motivate people and, and distrust in institutions is also uh, inherently linked to, uh, to conspiratorial belief. So earlier this year, we researched uh, Irish far-right communities online, another colleague of mine, Aoife, and myself, and specifically the use of these communities of the online telegram on online platform called Telegram. So what we, we looked at four case studies and looked at the activities of Irish far-right communities in reaction to a number of events. Uh, the first event was the shooting of George and Kensho. He was a black Irish man who was uh, shot over the Christmas period in Dublin. And we looked at the reaction amongst these communities on Telegram to the incident. Um, what was clear from the outset was that these communities wanted to use this incident to, first of all, push racist, uh, anti-Black disinformation, racist disinformation online about Nkencho and the wider uh, Black Irish community. Um, one of the earliest messages that was posted uh, about, uh, about the situation was make memes and get trolling, i.e make uh, posters, make images, and start sharing them online to try and, and upset or anger people to share false information about in Kensho. Uh, the poster you can see on the right, this is George and Kensho. Uh, the poster claims that in Kensho had 32 criminal convictions for violent offenses. This is false. This is not true. Uh, this is clarified and confirmed by the, the Gardaí, the Irish police and then shared by Irish media. But this originated and it's originated online and was really popularized by Irish far right communities um, online. And our, uh, these kinds of communities used this incident um, to target Black Irish communities and framing protesters uh, as, as BLM terrorists, as Black Lives Matter terrorists. Another incident we looked at as part of this research was um, Radhika Gorman, who was who is the um, minister for children here in Ireland, he's a he's a gay man, and he was appointed uh, last June, I think it was late June, early July. And what you really saw amongst these communities was an instant reaction, an instant rejection of of O'Gorman as the minister for children, and and the immediate linking of of his sexual orientation to his role as the minister for children. Um, there was an effort to link uh, O'Gorman to comments that he made about. Uh, Peter Thatchell, who has written about uh, paedophilia in The Guardian in recent years, and essentially trying to link O'Gorman to Thatchell by, by framing him as supportive of Thatchell's views, i.e. supportive of paedophilia and linking the two here together. What you really saw with this campaign was that uh, O'Gorman and the, and the reaction to O'Gorman's appointment, it became a megaphone for slurs, uh, a smear campaign acted that acted as an entry point for wider uh, discrimination directed against LGBTQ plus uh, communities and groups. There was the targeting of, of people or groups who attend Pride events in, in Dublin and Ireland, and also uh, LGBTQ uh, politicians and senators and things like this. And also um, 
a manifestation as of, of, of a protest movement to quote unquote protect protect the children, i.e., the children were vulnerable to such figures. And then there was this really moved, this, you could see how this moved from offline or from online to offline, sorry, um, in, in a quick time in, in the space of a few days. And then we had Irish far right groups um, marching in Dublin and they had very explicit banners um, about protecting and saving their children. And then there was nooses on the banners as well. So this moved on, offline in, 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 a, in a very, very quick time. Um, and, and then it was used as, as the kind of as a wider campaign against LGBTQ um, people. And then uh, harassment uh, from these communities is, is common. Uh, whoever their perceived enemy is, often it's the media, it's researchers, it may be left-wing um, groups or, or anti-racist, anti-fascist groups, and also politicians from, from that side of the aisle as well. And when you view these communities, you can see in real time these campaigns being orchestrated on Telegram. And Telegram is, does not have the same scale or reach as Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or, or even TikTok, these larger platforms. But what it does have is, is a very hands-off uh, content moderation approach, which means that a lot of the most explicit stuff that targets or, or discriminates against people or groups that would uh, result in a ban or a content takedown on the larger groups, it stays up on Telegram. So what you can see is the Telegram really acts as a staging platform for these explicit communities. And, and Telegram offers large scale public channels, but it also offers kind of group chat functions. And you can see in real time how these kinds of campaigns are orchestrated in real time to essentially move to the other platforms where they will try and get more eyeballs and uh, mo get more attention and, and notoriety um, from, from members of the public. And then another way we talk about orchestrated hate um, is used online. We must also take into account gaming and particularly as it relates to young people. Uh, earlier this year, some colleagues and I engaged in, in a scoping project exploring the use of gaming related platforms, Steam, Discord, Twitch, and DLive by extreme right, far right communities. Uh, the gaming world is expansive and allows huge numbers of people across the world to play and interact with one another. And with it, the, the cross pollination of content, cultures, ideas, and potential radicalization. Um, gaming communities have played an important role in the formation of contemporary extreme right culture. Gamergate uh, social, is a social phenomenon that saw mass mobilization and harassment uh, by gamers against female journalists, against female software and game developers in a pushback at the perceived intrusion into the gaming center, into their world, into their community. Um, and this has been seen by many as a pivotal moment in the formation of the, the so-called alternative right, so alt-right in the US and beyond, and the larger um, kind of 4chan culture, this, this, this transgressive, aggressive uh, culture online. What we aim to do with this research was explore the specific ways in which gaming is used by extremists, either as a tool through which to target new audiences or as a method uh, or, of building or strengthening new communities. Importantly, this, this series of research found limited evidence to suggest that online gaming is used as part of a deliberate strategy to groom new people into extremist movements. But instead, what we found was that gaming is predominantly used by extremists as a means of bonding uh, with their peers over a shared hobby. So that idea of community formation. The most obvious role filled by, by gaming in the extreme right channels analyzed uh, appears to be the strengthening of existing extremist communities. That is to say, um, extremists use games in the same way as any of the millions of other gamers, uh, other gamers do across the world as a means of having fun, socializing, and, and strengthening their community. On one platform, uh, Steam, we found evidence to suggest that, that gaming has also been used as a means of, of living out ideological fantasies and providing spaces for extremist role playing. For, for example, historical strategy games set in, in World War II during, uh, or during the Crusades uh, were particularly popular with extremist players promoting anti-Muslim or, or neo-Nazism in their commentary around the games. There also exist games where users can play as, as Nazi Germany and therein play out fantasies of white or, or Aryan supremacy. Um, across Discord and Steam, we observed users engaging in or, or calling on others to join in, in raiding. Uh, this is gamified harassment uh, of their perceived opponents. 
uh, in this activity, which it's, it's a long standing activity a tactic of internet trolls and the extreme right online harassment of minority groups is it's treated as a form of a real life game. Uh, and this acts as a potential vector to, to bring young people into contact with extreme right wing activity and communities online. And lastly, it's, it's important to point out that there is also a robust counter speech uh, movement on online platforms too. on Twitch, for example, we found an active community of creators that regularly produce content that criticizes extreme right topics or figures. Uh, and such users are very online and are very aware of extremist voices and so can can almost act as a as an early warning system or a monitor system for such kind of egregious uh, egregious behavior and then um another form of, of, of organized hate I'd like to cover is just the idea of accessibility or how low the barrier can be for being hateful online um Earlier this year, I released some research examining the state of extremism, extremism and hate speech on TikTok. TikTok has a reputation as a space for cooking videos and dance trends, and it is those things, but it also has over 1 billion users across the world, which means that it has a lot more than that as well. And no platform and indeed no demographic are exempt from extremist activity and opinions and behavior, especially, uh, especially on, the, on the larger platforms. Uh, we aim to address the knowledge gap on how unique aspects of TikTok are used at scale uh, to direct hatred at others. And we found that the videos and activity expressing support for extremism in the form of white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and other forms of hatred is easily discoverable on, on TikTok and is often allowed to remain on the platform, making it a safe space to hate. Uh, coded or veiled keywords are a popular tactic uh, of extremists on, on TikTok and online. Anti-Semitic hatred, for example, was at its most explicit in Holocaust denial on the platform. And this was often done by way of using coded or veiled keywords, especially items of food, along with more overt references such as ovens, uh, for example. And the use of, of such terms often escape efforts by platforms to catch offensive and extremist chatter, um, along with emojis. With, with emojis, we have symbols and signals that can be used to say a lot with very little effort. And there's a collective understanding amongst um, extremist communities and, and this, these kinds of in-groups of what an emoji may be used to refer to. And by way of a rope emoji or a knife emoji, a lot can be said, and these can be used to issue threats or support acts of violence. And hate is now extremely accessible and, and the barriers to entry are so low online. And platforms, uh, can also make it so easy to spread hatred and this, this specific point relates to TikTok in terms of how and, and Instagram and other platforms and how they offer uh, users a suite of, of editing tools and filters to produce what are sometimes very creative and technically impressive uh, pieces of content with, with, with users requiring few technical skills to do so. Uh, the image you see in the top left there is it's what's called the green screen effect on TikTok. So I can appear in front of a in front of an image. It's kind of like the filter we all use for Zoom backgrounds. Uh, the person here has elected to use uh, the inside of a, of a stable or a, a concentration camp. I think is their intention, and they're playing out uh, a dialogue about um, a person's family going missing, a Jewish person's family going missing during World War II. Um, so you can see the intent, uh, the anti-Semitic nature of the content, and these are uh, filters and tools that are that are baked into uh, to TikTok, um, such as the green screen. And then just to talk a little bit about platforms, um, it's very important to try and understand the role, the, the type of extremism and the, and, the, and the flow of extremism online is to try and understand networks and how networks differ. Uh, this iceberg, it's, it's, it's very helpful for visualizing these things. At the top, we have the open networks. These are the large scale social media platforms, the ones that do have scale, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I'd add, I'd add uh, TikTok to that now as well. These are the platforms that <clears throat> that offer a scale um, that where things really do take off. Uh, the claims, misleading claims, uh, conspiracies. They really do not kind of hit the mainstream until they hit this level. But a little bit below uh, are what we call closed networks. So we have Telegram, WhatsApp, Snapchat. These are enclosed platforms. Um, that can't be searched for. So this is where you often see some of the most uh, explicit extremist chatter. And this is kind of the, the staging platform that I mentioned before things hit the mainstream, hit the open platforms. 
And it's very hard to monitor from a, from a research, uh, from a journalistic point as well. It's very hard to monitor extremist activity on these platforms because uh, they, they are uh, closed by nature and they are private by nature. So it's very hard and, and, and it's, it's, it serves as a, as, a, as a red flag of sorts. I mean, of course, TikTok or uh, of course, WhatsApp and these kind of, of, of apps are used by all of us for very normal, circ for no normal circumstances, but it can serve um, it can serve as a, as a red flag if someone is engaging or has kind of shown signs of extremist activity and has shown a, 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 an interest in apps like Telegram that are shown to have more um, presence of extremist chatter than others. And at the bottom, uh, fringe networks, uh, Reddit is there. I personally wouldn't put it there myself, but we also have Gab, we have Discord, and we have 4chan. This is where uh, some of the most explicit content is shared. Uh, these platforms don't have terms of service. They have very few rules. So you can essentially say what you want. And, and it's not so much a, a, a freedom of speech space as a freedom to hate uh, kind of space. And then just before wrapping up, talking about uh, extremism and COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 has been a boost to extremists, uh, the far right in particular in Ireland and beyond, and it's provided new opportunities to organize, to mobilize, and for potential for recruitment. Um, at the heart of the far right response to COVID-19 have been attempts to target and erode trust in democratic institutions, government parties, state bodies, and use the frustrations of the public to embed themselves further in communities. Uh, throughout COVID, far-right groups have been at the forefront of protests who framed government responses to decisions uh, as against the general public. Um, we have also see uh, far-right groups attempt to place themselves at the heart of communities through initiatives like food drops, helping the homeless, these kinds of things. Um, lockdown policies were seized upon by far-right uh, entities uh, who were among the earliest groups to either organize or participate in anti-mask and anti-lockdown protests. Um, and these communities have relied on conspiracy theories and mis- and disinformation at all times to criticize or discredit uh, government or state responses to the pandemic. In 2020, uh, this was demonstrated mostly in claims centered around the origins of, of COVID-19, racist claims about minority communities spreading it throughout Ireland or throughout different countries and invoking claims about 5G as well. Um, and then really since 2021, these have developed into claims about vaccines, uh, pushing theories that the vaccines are killing thousands or millions of people, uh, false claims about ingredients within the vaccine and also responding to COVID developments with threats of violence, uh, for example, around the possible introduction or introduction of vaccine passports. And what we're witnessing really in, in many countries is the intersection of conspiracies, disinformation, harassment, and extremism, all of which have created an increasingly hybridized threat landscape. Uh, COVID-19 has served as a catalyst for conspiracies, uh, disinformation, and the wider extremist nexus, and has allowed extremists to march and protest on the street to critique the government and to grow their influence and, and ultimately uh, expand their reach. And lastly, uh, where to next, just throwing, throwing it out, uh, some topics and issues that we're, we're paying uh, more and more attention to are climate and environmental issues, the idea of, of climate denialism, of course, but also conspiracies related to climate and extremism related to climate um, too. Questions of identity, gender and sexual orientation, what, are, what we really mean here is, is the kind of hostility extended towards uh, people of transgender people. And then migration and race, we see this, this is one of the kind of core, um, core traits of, of far right communities in, in extending and in racism towards um, immigrants to the country and um, post post COVID-19 life if there ever be such a thing um, and lastly just what else and uh, I'd like to hear from other people as well but at that stage I'll hand it back and happy to answer any questions at this stage.